live. And there it is. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anissa Rasibi George. Thanks for joining my Facebook Live. Today's conversation is a part of my Listen and Learn series where I jo join community members on Facebook Live to bring awareness around their work. I believe that the best way to find solutions to our most pressing is by making sure that everyone has a seat at the table. If you have organizations or guests you recommend for this Facebook Live broadcast in the future, please email me at anisa at anisaforboston.com. For today's discussion, I'm excited to host a Listen and Learn Roundtable to discuss student mental health and access to services. I will add that we sometimes call this series a community impact series with either community impact organizations or individuals. And this group here before you today is certainly an engaged group of individuals who are working to support our students across the Boston Public Schools. I'm really grateful to be joined by guidance counselors and a school support team specialist and a school counselor um, who are playing very important roles in the lives of our children, especially today, always, but especially today. And as any of you listening and watching at home, know that I'm a former high school teacher in Boston. I taught for 13 years at East Boston High School. And uh, many times throughout the, those 13 years, I leaned on our school counselors to support me as a classroom teacher and supporting our kids uh, in our building. And, and so these are very much unsung heroes in the work that they're doing. And you may recognize that one of the names on today's panel is similar to mine. Um, we'll just get it over with. My sister, Sonia Rasaibi, is a school counselor. And I can say for sure, without doubt, she's working harder now during this pandemic than she's ever worked over the course of her career. And she works pretty hard, if I do say so myself. But I'd also like to in introduce uh, the rest of our panelists today. We have Val Valdino um, from The O'Brien. We have Zong Nguyen from Excel in South Boston and Jessica Martinez, who's a student support team specialist over at Fenway. And Jessica and I are connected in a very special way. She's a former student of mine uh, when I taught. In a couple of days, we're actually going to do Jessica Facebook Live. We didn't invite you because we have you here. We had you on announcement day. But we have uh, a panel similar to this with former students talking. So maybe we can sneak you in. Uh, but I'm just I'm grateful for all of you uh, joining us today. And I'll start with Sonia. Um, what is a school counselor and what are the different roles that our counselors play in our schools across the city? Thank you so much. And it's so awesome to be here today, <laughs> um, you know, having this really important conversation. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to school counseling, um, to me, we work with all students. Um, we don't, you know, really target students in any particular way. We really work with all students in some shape or form on academic support, social support, emotional support, connecting them to resources, and also working with all the people around them, their families, teachers, staff members in the school, and also folks from outside organizations that support our students too. So it's really important to know that, you know, we don't um, only work with students individually who are experiencing crisis. We're really working with all students in some shape or form, as well as all the people around them. Jessica, you are a um, student support specialist. Can you talk a little bit about how your role may be different than Sonia's? And then Mal and Zong, I'd love to hear about your jobs. Uh, well, honestly, um, as we heard from Sonia, uh, it's not very different. Um, you know, uh, probably we're just degrees that um, separate us or that you know, keeps us apart, but in, in reality, um, our line of work is very, very, very similar. Um, at Fenway High School, we are um, very, very privileged to have a three student support coordinator amongst us. Each, you know, has um, different specialties, specialize either in uh, social work or an actual counselor. Uh, so, uh, Fenway High School being three. I think that um, we are able to support our school um, in, you know, different ways, culturally and also uh, able to, uh, you know, access 
um, target populations and being able to, um, you know, discuss different things amongst us. We we have diversity. And I think that, um, as Sonia said, we're supporting students with social emotional needs, everything from um, cultural backgrounds, if there need if there's need to translate, um, we're all, you know, there to support. So very much so, just like Sonia, and I'm pretty sure that um, in Balduino's goal, in his role, um, he experiences the same at OB. I love it. Val, tell us a little bit about your work uh, at OB. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thanks for having me here. I'm so glad to be here. Um, very similarly, similarly to the both of you, I think, um, to add to what Sonia was saying, um, I think about the three areas that school counselors focus on. Um, you have the, the academic piece, which encompasses their student schedule, um, progress monitoring, graduation tracking, making sure that they're on track to graduate on time. Thinking of the social emotional piece. So as school counselors, we're not therapists, but we are trained in mental health and we can do um, mental health counseling as well. We just don't necessarily have the time for it because like Sonia said, we're seeing all students. And then my favorite part, the college and career support. Um, and that's an area where I think there's not a lot of focus on, but when I think about working with first generation kids, as many of my students are, um, that's an area that there's, there's, there's just a lot of support that our students need Ev everywhere from content knowledge. What is a two year college versus a four year college, right? Um, private versus public financial aid terms, right? So there's, there's a lot to applying to college other than, you know, pressing submit or writing your essay. And there's a lot of knowledge that we also need to teach students. Um, and so those three areas really encompass the, uh, the work that we do. And I've always said that when I think about school counselors, we are one of the few people in a school building that are involved in so many different areas of a student's life. When you think about their academic schedule, mental health and home life concerns, um, you know, we're, we're collaborating and consulting with teachers. We're helping them think about their futures. Oftentimes I'll get involved in conversations around discipline. Um, and, and that kind of thing, school operations, right? And so we're, we're intricately involved in all of the facets of a student's life in a school day. Um, and, and not too many educators have that or, 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 or do that given what their roles are. Yes. Uh, oh. Tell us a little bit about your work and how it might uh, differ in any ways to Sonia, Jessica's and Val's. Uh, like I think, I also like to thank everybody here to uh, inviting me here and uh, to discuss this. This is a very important conversation that we're having today. And my role uh, is almost all the same, all three. But uh, recently, we had a change in how guidance counselors work. We become uh, student development counselors, and and how our role has changed a little bit. Uh, for myself, I be I, I do a lot of registrar stuff. Now, now they're taking away the registrar's role in the in the high school, and I become the registrar, and I do the, a lot of the master scheduling for the uh, for the students, and that's a big piece of it. Also, I like to add that we also do we're a big advocate beyond the academics and the uh, you know um, college and career information, but we also do a lot of advocacy for students. We become their uh, sort of their backbone to support around academics and to put support around family. And we do a lot of crisis intervention as well, because I know there's a lot of things that are doing a lot of griefing and a lot of uh, supports around uh, helping students and families uh, get resources. We do a lot of that as uh, school counselors. And, you know, I do a lot of, uh, you know, outreach to a lot of parents and uh, around food resources or, uh, you know, internet issues. I become, we become an uh, intricate piece of that uh, since this pandemic is happening. And uh, I don't know, that's pretty much, uh, you know, what I can add to what our roles are. If I could add one thing to that. Yeah, go right ahead, please. None of us mentioned, because we, we probably all don't love doing this, but the testing, right? So whether it's MCAS, PSAT, SAT, AP, so facilitating, ordering tests, proctoring, right? Any, anything involved with like testing, which is very much a part of school, um, the school counselors are, are, are consistently involved with that as well. So I didn't want to forget about that. No, I appreciate that because that is a uh, an unfortunate part. I think of of too many people, too many educators' days, um, and too many hours. I think you know, I, I once there was once a data point shared, especially during a more traditional school year, where of 180 school days, at least 29 are spent on standardized testing, and that doesn't include. I, I don't I don't imagine that that's changed too much, although just virtual learning has uh, changed a lot, but 
that's the 29 standardized testing sort of days and then build in regular classroom assessments and, and what teachers are doing by the, you know, over the course of their own um, uh, curriculum, their own, their own work in their classroom. So I, I think that over time, it's probably accurate to say that the guidance counselor, the school counselor, the counselor's job has certainly evolved and changed. And we certainly see that now during the pandemic and students, for the most part, we, knew, we know some kids are already in school buildings and, and more will be arriving soon. But can you talk, and I'll start Zong with you, about how your work has maybe changed because kids are virtual. And before you go, I do want to make a note, anyone watching this uh, Facebook Live, if you've got questions that you want to ask, add them into the comment section and we'll, we'll try to get to them over the course of this hour. So Zong, how, how has your day and your work changed, both over time because the role of a counselor has changed, but also during COVID and during the mostly virtual learning? Thank you. For, uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I've been thinking about this as well. And my role has changed a lot. I've been in this uh, as a guidance counselor for over 13, year, uh, 13 years now. And my role has changed a lot. And I've, you know, uh, you know, we do a lot of counseling, but uh, now it's even more uh, problematic because I, I'm doing a lot of techn technology stuff. And on top of that, I'm trying to do facilitate uh, outreach to families in need. And that's where I, my role has changed a lot uh, beyond the academics and the uh, support just for the student. But now it's for the family, trying to get them, families should I get on uh, on Aspen or SIS, the, the, the system, and trying to help them figure out ac uh, their students' academics are. And that's my role has changed a lot in that sense. And, uh, and I, no, I don't stop at 2.20, I like when school ends, I go beyond that. I go to almost five or six, depends on the, even the weekends. You know? And uh, even with school vacation, it doesn't feel like school vacation. I'm still working with students that are in need. So that's the other thing that's, um, that's changed a lot for, my, for me as a school. You know, I, I appreciate that very much. And Val, I imagine uh, your work day has changed for sure. And, and tell us about how you're interacting with your students um, on a regular day. Yeah, that's a great question. So it, it's definitely changed a lot. And, and I'm, at, I'm actually at a new school this year. Um, and, you know, the whole notion and idea of remote learning and Zooming um, was, was very scary to me. Um, but I think the, the use of Zoom has helped a lot because my meetings with students kind of, sort of feel the same, except that they're physically not there. But in terms of having a one-on-one -on -one meeting and being able to connect with students, Zoom has helped facilitate that for sure. In terms of how it's changed, when, when I think of like some of my students who are, you know, and a lot of students are, are not are underperforming right now or, or failing due to severe mental health issues, this lack of student engagement um, or social interaction, lack of teacher interaction. So a lot of students are just not doing well. And so typically, you know, I'd walk down the hall and go grab a student, um, have a quick conversation with them, reach out to the parent if needed. Um, and now for those students, I worry about them the most because it's, it's a lot more difficult to reach them. I can't walk down a hall. And so one thing that I've done that I haven't, hadn't done before, um, is my ninth year in BPS, but I've done two or th uh, three home visits this year where, you know, we're outside, you know, everybody's got their masks on and all that. And just like being able to see a student live, um, I saw the, the smile gleaming through that mask and it just, it felt really good. Um, and you know, but like the, in terms of capacity, right? Do we, ha I don't have the capacity to do that for all of my students who are not doing well. Right. And so, you know, it also takes some time to schedule a zoom meeting, right? Back at school, students waltz into my office all day, every day. And, and now it's, it's a little bit more formal. So, so at the same time, kids are learning that skill. They, they know how to officially schedule a meeting. I use Calendly, um, which is a scheduling platform. But before, you know, they'd walk into the, to my office or I'd walk into the classroom and say, hey, come with me. I used to love walking or the cafeteria the or the hallway or out front. Right. I know a lot of people hate lunch duty, but I actually love I love lunch duty. I do my best work in the cafeteria. Yep. Right? I always I asked for lunch duty when I was teaching. I, I was my notebook, I my laptop. Yep. And I get yep. work done in the cafeteria. And so in terms of access to students, um, obviously in person, I had a lot more access and now it's a, it's a bit, it's a lot difficult. It's more formal. Um, and you know, I feel like I'm not reaching as many students as I normally would in a traditional year. And so that has changed. Um, but I think there's a lot from this remote learning period that I'm going to use yeah. moving forward 
um, when we do get back to a more traditional version or traditional style of schooling. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think we are going to see that across lots of different set, sort of industries that we've, we've made some changes that are very much worth keeping. Now, Val mentioned, and this question is for Jessica and Sonia, that, or Zong, actually, if you want to chime in too, or if Val, you want to go further. Val, you mentioned students failing, and I'm going to assume you mean both academically getting Fs or much lower grades, or failing in the sense that they're not feeling success, like they're sort of falling off from what they should be doing or accomplishing or their engagement isn't where it was. And, and to me, that's a failure, uh, maybe not a traditional capital F, but the system is failing them because of what's happening and because of, uh, of the challenge and some of the resources. Could you talk a little bit, and I'll start with Jessica or Sonia, on the experience that some of our kids are having, especially around failing, either in the literal or figurative way? Yeah, Sonia, can you hear yeah. me? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I know um, with my experience now through the pandemic and, and seeing how students are um, actually asking like, hey, miss, when when am I able to see you in person? There are things that I want to talk about that I'm not too comfortable talking about at home. I feel like my aunt and my aunt's sister's friends, cousins, brothers, sisters here, and I can't talk right now. Um, so. I know that some of the uh, lack of engagement, it's because of sometimes, unfortunately, we're looking at things from safety or um, living amongst, you know, fam a large group of family members that they're not comfortable, you know, uh, speaking to. Um, and I'm seeing now that uh, the, the lack of engagement and also um, attendance, it being an issue um, during this time and during the pandemic is one of the one of the biggest issues that um, some family members, you see that um, the student may have become the breadwinner. I'm sorry, my nephew's also here and he's running around. <laughs> but um, as we know that some of our students, they are the primary breadwinner, maybe because their family or their family members are undocumented and they're finding themselves having to work either double or picking up shifts just to make sure that, um, you know, bills are met or um, food remains on the table. So a lot of um, the the requests that I get um, are not new, but um, they have they have become more a, a priority when I do connect with my students. Where um, we are, of course, checking in and making sure that everyone is safe and everyone is doing well and healthy. But um, there are more uh, in-depth questions, um, which I try to, you know, express them in conversation and not just, you know, as interrogation. Because I know that a lot of students during this time are really feeling, um, you know, anxiety and in, in, in that. Pressure of you know saying the right thing you know so um, not the so you know families won't find themselves in um, in a different situation or at or answering you know harder harder questions um, and I know that across the schools we're we're seeing um, a truancy issue and um, uh, the district may see it as lack of engagement but uh, in reality what we we have to um, shed light on is making sure that we are aware that our families and and um, our students are working really hard during this time and um, knowing that the, 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 the kind of supports that family members need aren't always as accessible as people think that they are, um, especially because of language barriers. Um, and especially because of language barriers, sometimes uh, access to resources become limited um, or uh, become inaccessible because families, they, um, you know, in lamest terms, they, they get freaked out and they're like, press one for English or two for Spanish. And then it's like after that prompt, they're asking for probably documentation or information that the family members may not know because of either, um, you know, lack of uh, the ability to read or comprehend um, and students are doing that simultaneously. So shout out to our students. I, I really yeah. do believe that this is something that um, it's like, you know, this is the strongest battle and our strongest soldiers right now are our students and they're, and they're showing up even if, 
you know, the numbers are saying that they're not, but they really, really are. Oh, I appreciate you recognizing the, um, the challenges our kids are facing and how hard they're working to succeed. Sonia, would you talk a little bit about this this sort of the, the, the issue around failing? And I, again, in sort of air quotes, failing versus and failing. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to echo what Jessica said, like, I think our kids are doing so much and under such um, challenging circumstances. And I think, you know, I, I have students who are absolutely used to, you know, close to 100% attendance, um, really strong marks but this year is so different. And I think part of it is, you know, being outside of the school building for the vast majority of students, um, every time they have a class period, and I work with all the eighth graders, every time they have a new class period is a new decision that they have to make. Do I click, join Zoom, or do I not? You know, and I think for our students who are um, struggling with mental health issues, dealing with issues in the home, um, every time that they have to make that decision is, can, you know, it, it can easily be a yes or a no, depending on what, what's going on. And if we were in the school building, um, you know, there's social pressures, positive peer pressure, you know, um, for, for students to attend class. And there's just so many more people kind of around to support them in whatever challenges that they have. So I think when we're thinking about, you know, why are more students of ours failing, it's really, you know, it's really dealing with, you know, what is the nature of Zoom? What is going on, um, you know, in, in their home? Um, and, you know, how can we support them remotely to, you know, to finish the school year strong? And I will say, you know, I know the teachers that I work with are really flexible, are really here to support the students so that, you know, we're trying to avoid that that student, you know, going down a path of, of you know, Fs and Ds on their report card um, and, you know, trying to, trying to support them wherever they can, even though it's limited in this re remote world. Well, Sonia, you know uh, that a lot of my work has found me sort of in the mental health space. And what I worry about when we do return to more in-person education as we bring, start bringing kids back, and certainly in the fall when I hope that kids will all be back in full time and we've got sort of all the systems in place to make sure that that can happen. I really worry about the second leg of this pandemic being a mental health crisis, especially for our young people and our older people, our seniors who have been in extreme isolation this last year. But in particular, thinking about mental health issues, talk a little bit about, if you don't mind, what some of your students are experiencing what should our parents and our families and those who, who worry about young people be, be, what should they be paying attention to? And then my capacity as a city councilor, as, especially as chair of the education committee, what are the things that I should be advocating for to make sure our kids have in place for when they return to school? So what's happening now? What are they dealing with? What should families and concerned community members be worried about and pay attention to? And how do we prepare for what's next? Is that a question to all of us? That's just Sonia. I'm starting. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Sonia. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, it, it's been said a thousand times before, but I'll say it again. What we're, what our, our students are experiencing, um, is really, um, basically, you know, the emphasis of what's been going on for years. Um, racism. Um, issues around poverty that are really rearing its ugly head in so many more ways highlighted by the pandemic. So I think, you know, what students are facing right now um, are kind of mental health issues that may have existed pre-pandemic, but are really, really highlighted here because like you said, Anissa, they're often isolated. Um, they, you know, may be struggling academically and may not exactly know or feel like they can ask for help, um, even if help is offered. Um, you know, I think, you know, in my meetings with students, you know, um, sometimes, and I think Jessica spoke to it, depending on the home environment, I tell students, I don't care if it's noisy, that's totally cool. Like, um, you might hear my cat meow, like, it's, it's fine. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, they may not feel comfortable. And um, so often, I might be Zooming with a student, 
and they might just communicate to me through chat and you know and i'll take anything you know at this point as long as i'm connecting with students but i think that i mean there there has to be you know some mental health impact when you're not connecting to people as you would in a normal year um and i think you know when we're thinking about um sort of what our students need when we return to some level of normalcy is you know a huge kind of emphasis uh, emphasis on um, sort of dealing with mental health needs, creating creating opportunities for students to connect with one another. And I'm you know I'm selfishly thinking of my student population. I'm dealing with eighth graders, and they start at BLA in seventh grade. Seventh grade was cut short, you know. Um, so they're to me they're very new to the school. They don't have all the connections that the upperclassmen have. Um, so how can we think? you know, really intentionally about creating spaces, um, events, opportunities for students to connect to one another and, you know, really kind of create those connections um, where there was such an absence of it this year. And it's not for lack of trying. We have virtual clubs and all that um, through our school, but, you know, I think it's really, really hard to to stay connected um, in this virtual world. So I think, you know, in terms of priorities, mental health and just, ways to kind of, you know, create situations where students can be social with one another in a healthy way. No, I definitely. Really, I want to wish two takeaways that I have from Sonia's comments. Um, one, Sonia says, I'll take anything to communicate with students. So whether it's vir virtually, via chat, via like just, you know, that desire to communicate and be connected to kids, and then how important it will be and I'd love to hear sort of, you know, what the future might hold or what you hope the future might hold in the other school communities around this. What Sonia said to create connections. So for newer kids to a school building, how do you create connections? And I would add to that, rebuild some of the bonds that existed maybe before, because, you know, so much has changed in our world. And I worry about the grief our kids may feel returning back to a school community for lots of different reasons. So Jessica, Zong, Val, you know, how do we create those stronger connections and rebuild, rebuild some of the bonds that are, are very much broken during this time? I, I want to piggyback a little on what um, Sonia also uh, was speaking on and, you know, creating a space or building those connections, even virtual. Um, and knowing that we have, um, we have faced this pandemic and we've witnessed all of you know all of the all of the discrepancies virtually that we could you know face in a in a time where we we never introduced this kind of learning to our students because it was all you know very hands on in the school building um, but we also have to shed light in understanding that before this pandemic and I know that it's been talked about in conversations in the past but um, do we realize the lack of access that our students in the district um, had before, did not have before, um, you know, the pandemic? For example, when in the when in the time of BPS did we hear that Chromebooks could be taken home? And all of a sudden now through this pandemic, Chromebooks are available to all of our students. And, you know, um, you know some people may say, oh, you know, but there's you know, there's trial and error and there's processes and we need to make sure that we are uh, mindful of our technology. But with the push of knowing that our students already um, were so far behind with access in comparison to other districts or other schools in other, you know, states or even towns right over um, from the city of Boston, we know that the lack of access that our students um, had with even internet access. And that's also one of the many reasons why our students are um, falling behind or um, having lack of engagement um, with that, you know, security of knowing that they could continuously connect because of lack of access. Um, so what can we do to 
provide students accessibility to things like this. And, and the engagement then comes with the access that the student may have around them or the support. Um, but we do know that essentially it first starts with what the student does not have and how can we provide that support to make sure that the student is fully functioning, meaning if it's virtual, if they have all the bells and whistles and making sure that the student can in fact be present. Because if the student is worrying about like, oh miss, can you hear me? Or oh miss, I, 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 my internet, or oh my mom hasn't paid this bill. Like these are things that we need to address before we continuously blame the kind of you know commitment that our students have to their education. Because believing in them in, is one thing, but making right. sure that they have the right supports is another. And saying right. like, oh, you get a Chromebook now because we're now virtual, but what happened then? Right. When students had to stay long nights or long afternoons in the library, that sometimes their libraries weren't even fully equipped with the right resources to, you know, uh, do a proper research paper. Um, and I could go on and on, but yes, Sonia, I am with you. And probably with Mr. Nguyen and Mr. Gonzalez in, in the sense of like, we know that we are here to support our students, but what are things that we as counselors or we as student support coordinators or um, staff in the building know that our students don't have that we, you know, run to their aid to make sure like, hey, you need a home visit, meet me on your porch, you know, when it's safe to do so. I absolutely love, absolutely love the idea of these home visits. And, and there have been a number of efforts over the years. And I know before I left uh, East Boston High School, there was some work around the home visits and you know, doing that, doing it safely and sort of thoughtfully and strategically is really important. Val and Zong, talk to, uh, talk to me a little bit about this, you know, creating those critical connections that either never were formed because school was cut short last year, and then this conversation around, you know, efforts to rebuild those bonds because the trust between an adult and a kid in a building, it's so hard to get there. Yeah. And then once you're there, to lose it, is devastating to the kid for sure. We know that, but it's also devastating to the adults that are, you know, just really like just love their kids, which I just from this short conversation know how much you all love your kids. Val and Zong. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and Jessica's over here preaching, so I agree with a lot of what you said. But I think as as a district and as a city, we need to be very, very intentional and very, very explicit, right? So I think about the fact that um, MCAS is still going on potentially going mm -hmm. on for our for our elementary school students this spring and how how that's a, a mistake and I'm just gonna say that fully transparent right um, we're, we're so focused on business as usual and at the end of the day we are still in a pandemic people are still dying right and we can't ignore that even though we would like to meet, move forward and we do want our students to learn and so I think about our kindergartners I think about students entering high school for the first time you know they're entering this is their introduction to school. Right, they're re remote learning. It's we're in a pandemic. It doesn't feel natural, and so I think as schools, as a district, I think about even this spring. So hopefully we are back to normal in the fall. But even this spring, you know, utilizing the warm weather to to perhaps do field days or to 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 find ways for students to to connect with each other in person. Right, I think you know there are a lot of virtual opportunities. You know, we have virtual clubs and and all these things, but students aren't aren't attending. Perfect example, you know, this week our, our basketball team's playing, you know, a bunch of games this week and there's a bunch of Zoom links, but students aren't attending, right? Whereas if we were in the gym, you know, it'd be packed. Um, in fact, I think today would have been the City League basketball tournament down at Madison Park and obviously that's not happening. And so I think, yes, we are in a pandemic and yes, we should be safe. Safety is of paramount concern, but how do we find safe opportunities for students to engage with each other. I really worry about the middle school to high school age group, right? Um, I feel like elementary school students, you know, they like Zoom, they're gonna turn on their cameras and engage with their teachers and they're home with their parents and they're kind of enjoying this. Um, I shouldn't say, well, not all of them, but yeah, I feel like- I don't, I don't know about that, I hear from lots of parents. Yeah, well, no, I get that and I respect that. Um, but, I, but I'm thinking more so the, you know, cause I'm seeing it on, on my end, right? Students that are that don't have their cameras on and, they're sort of behind the, the screens of their computer in this abstract world, yeah. right? 
I lead an advisory session every week and sometimes I feel like I'm just talking to myself because no one's responding or they'll only respond in the chat. And so I think, you know, to piggyback off what I was saying earlier, like we're seeing a lot of mental health concerns because of this just pure isolation, yeah. right? And students who have done well historically um, are not doing well, right? And also, I don't want to forget about the students who are thriving right now, because there are students who are thriving right now. And so what happens to them when we go back to normal, right? When, 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 because what, 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 what are the issues that they're going to be facing? So I think to sum up my thoughts, I think um, as, a, as a state, as a city, and as a district, we need to slow down, stop worrying about assessments, stop worrying about these lear learning loss, right? It is what it is. Students are, 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 are losing out when it comes to learning. That well, I want, can I just push back on you for a second? Sure. Now, the learning loss is real. And I do worry about, you know, we've talked a lot about the achievement gap. We've talked a lot about the discrepancies between especially our city's district and some of the more wealthier suburban districts. But even within our school district, the differences and the opportunities that so many of our kids have is so vastly different. And there is a very direct correlation between learning loss, academic achievement, and life expectancy. Um, yeah. So that, that really, is true. you have to be really creative about rebuilding those bonds. That and, is very true. Yeah. I think, um, I guess my point is, I think when it comes to learning loss, I think we're, we, we test our students to death. Right. right? And I think, yeah. I okay. think the, to me, the mental health piece is far yeah. more important than learning yeah, that's loss. That's going to be the next crisis. Aren't, be significant. If they're not doing well, <laughs> then the, the, the education takes a back seat. So, so mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, learning is important. Yeah. If our students are not mentally doing well, yep. Amen. Yep. How, how do we how do we get to the learning? We we can't even get to the learning yet. And I think mm -hmm. that's what I mean. Like we need to pause for a second, focus mm -hmm. on that, then we'll get to the learning. Yeah, and we can catch up with that learning loss if we're Absolutely. taking care of that other piece. Absolutely. Absolutely. Agree with you. Zong, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. I, 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 interrupt I, me. I, I agree. My, with my time, everybody. but it's not, no, no. It's not content. I, I, I agree with everybody, whatever they said, but the biggest piece is they need to mourn their loss. They yes. have to look back at the one year they've lost in eighth grade or one year, they need to look back and, and we need to slow down like Val said and look at that and take a week and we invite the families in and, and talk about the mental health piece and talk about the, uh, the health care in, in, in inequities. Because all these parents, they're gonna be a lot of uh, other people getting sick and it's a, these things are gonna happen, but no one's really looking at that. And you know, with, they're failing in school because the issues at home that their parents are sick or their grandparents are sick or their their brother is sick that, that's going to be uh, we have to look at that meant uh, the healthcare issue here too on top of what what we're looking at because in the end you know these kids uh, there is a mental health uh, there's a mental health issue but i think it, it stems from them not having the health care i don't know a lot of kids don't believe in counseling they don't want to do counseling or I don't, they don't want to even go, join a group but the peer to peer interaction is critical that was their way kids way of uh, feeling better about themselves. They had the opportunity to you know, chat with each other and they felt better about it. And not, not to see an adult, not to see a counselor, but see a peer to peer. And that's another thing that, you know, that needs to be thought about. And how do we bring back the, these students into our buildings and have like a week of not education, but a week of just understanding what their loss has been and right. understanding what the pandemic was all about. And that's yeah, where that, I think we need to- That's absolutely educate. tied to that rebuilding piece. And I think that that's, Really fantastic. So I, I want to note in our comment section on Facebook, um, Arlene says, just throwing this out there, guidance counselors in schools are often the starting place for families who are concerned about their child's mental health, especially when they have de a deep understanding of their role. I would love for this conversation to take place in other languages too. And um, for our non-English, non-limited English speaking family. So I think that that's an excellent, thank you Arlene for that suggestion. I do wanna put this out to the panel today, the role of cultural competencies, the role of language specific services and in your school communities, is that available to our kids and to our families? And the one thing I'd, I'd add to this, and you know, in our family, my family and Sonia's family, Many of our cultural and ethnic groups, um, especially our, our newer ethnic groups, newer immigrant students to, this, to the United States, there's a lot of um, family resistance and cultural resistance to accessing mental health services. I've, I've, I, I, maybe Sonia has never heard me say this on, on the record, but I've said a number of times on the record, as a high schooler, I would express 
um, certain anxieties and, and depression that I was experiencing. And my dad would reply back, it's all in your head. And I'd say, yes, actually it is. But to him, it was like a figment of imagination and it wasn't real. But that's certainly the, the truth that many of our kids are experiencing um, across the spectrum. So I don't know, Zong, if we want to start with you and then we'll go to Sonia just because I'm calling her out. But let's talk about the cultural competency piece. Um, let's talk about sort of the critical role that you all play. And what are the resources that families who are logged in today, what can they tap into in addition to their school counselor or their support specialist? Sonia, I'll start with you. Or Zong, since you're already. Okay. Uh, like, yeah, I, you know, I, I dealt with a lot of EL students, uh, English language learning students. And the biggest piece was it starts from the district. I know I went to a, a, a meeting for uh, Vietnamese parents and the district and they didn't have translators. And that was the issue I'm facing. And I'm like, the, if the families don't have those supports, how can we, they support, how can they support our, us as the teachers or as counselors with their students? And that's the thing I was like, I was strange and I was doing, you know, I was helping translate for our families when, you know, the district has all this funding and there's no uh, translation uh, supports for families that want to come to these meetings and talk about, COVID, because the, the superintendent wanted to talk about COVID and there's no translation or there was translation, but they had to pay for it over the phone. And that was an issue that I, I was seeing. So that's one thing I saw that was very difficult, uh, very like, it, it's inequitable. I don't know what to, uh, to say about that. I don't know if anybody wants to add about that. I, I absolutely agree. And um, these are one of the things that I feel that, um, just like breathing and just like eating, there has to there has to be translation wherever you go. We are in a city that is so diverse where in fact this should be this should not be a conversation in saying, you know, there is lack of translation for um, students and families, um, and so especially for the student population that we serve. Um, I do in fact also see myself, you know, um, in situations where as a counselor, and as we all know, we are um, men and women and people of, of many hats, right, in a building where one day, you you are translating um, or you are introducing, you know, a student to their teachers in their classrooms and making sure that they are navigating the space as they should. Um, imagine that now um, heightened in this virtual world and, um, you know, having to do a one-on-one -on -one or just like a practice or a trial run of how to start Zoom or how to sign in or log in for families that in fact have been reading emails through their child's you know, email, and they don't know how to access the internet. So um, knowing that in this time, we we as counselors or we as student support coordinators or, or staff alike, we are finding ourselves, um, like Mr. Nguyen, having to translate really tough conversations and then students turning around and saying, hey, I thought you were on my side. So we're like playing many roles and saying like, no, we're not the bad guy, but we have to, you know, communicate with DCF or your parent that, you know, something is happening and there's no set um, divide or there's no separation when it comes to our jobs or um, what we're linked to. Because um, if you are a counselor, you're already a unicorn. But then when you speak another language, it's just like you're now on a, no, a whole nother level of, of being like needed in every space. So um, I do see that as well, Mr. Nguyen, and, and um, find myself sort of like torn um, on how now during this pandemic, we are building relationship and rapport also with our students and also with our families, because the information sometimes that we hold or that we have to share out with the families is not always, oh, your child is doing great or, oh, your child just missed a day of school. Now we're talking about everything from, you know, we may have to file or we may have to, you know, speak on, um, what are the needs or what is the child's needs or translating in a sensitive meeting like an S, um, like a IEP meeting um, if there's lack of translation. So I'm very much with you because um, if I haven't turned into an octopus lady yet, <laughs> then I don't know when, but it's coming soon. 
Well, I think it's great. To, uh, well, I think it's great to describe yourselves as unicorns. I think it's unfortunate to feel like a unicorn, although unicorns are beautiful. Uh, but they don't exist. You all exist in reality and are doing this very real work. Sonia, tell me a little bit about um, the you know the importance of the cultural competency uh, and also about additional resources that families should be aware of. That you know, in addition to reaching out to you, what are those tools that you share with families and with kids? Yeah, I mean, I just want to say first and foremost, um, translation is absolutely key. Um, I've used the interpretation service that is offered to BPS staff um, probably over a hundred times this year. Wow. Um, but I think what's what is a hundred percent essential is that um, you know translation interpretation only goes so far. If I'm speaking to um, a Vietnamese um, speaking family parent about um, anything concerning mental health, I'm just saying Vietnamese as an example. There's an interpreter between us. I already need to have a relationship with this family because to have a conversation around mental health without having an already established relationship with the family makes that conversation that much more difficult. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, um, I'm blessed in a lot of ways because I only have only have 280 students on my caseload. But the recommended caseload is 250 by ASCA, by our, our school counselor association. So whenever we can reduce that number, that allows us to have those conversations where we build relationships with our families, that we both share similar cultural backgrounds, and also those families that we don't share similar cultural backgrounds. And, um, you know, I think, I think if we can reduce caseload sizes, then, you know, we can, we can um, be so much more powerful in the work that we have with families. Um, so I think interpretation and translation services are minimum. Um, I think, you know, um, some of the tools that honestly have kind of um, come up through this whole COVID um, experience has been um, really, really helpful. And one of those is talking points. It allows me to text message with families um, and it automatically translates the message into the family's home language. So whether it's Albanian, whether it's Spanish, whether whatever it is, whatever the home language is, it'll translate automatically. And I think that's huge and important. Um, and I also think kind of, you know, that that stress on relationship building, I think is huge. I mean, I feel like I keep coming back to it, but I think wherever we can create relationships with families before crisis happens, um, that is so important. And wherever we can learn about how to better communicate with families, especially those that don't share our um, similar backgrounds, I think it's it's hugely important too. Um, so wherever you know, wherever we can kind of have that time and freedom to do that, I think is um, you know is is priceless, really. Yeah, and those bonds that you build with young people are invaluable bonds. Val, talk to me a little bit about this conversation around cultural competency, uh, access to language, both translation and having providers that speak the native languages of our kids and their families. Yeah, thanks. I think it's a great question. It's huge, right? I think of, um, you know, at my school, we have a, a pretty large um, percentage of students who are Cape Verdean, so I'm Cape Verdean. Um, and so when I, when I talk to their parents, it's almost like a sigh of relief. Um, that they can talk to someone that speaks their language. Um, and, and connecting back to, to what Sonia was saying, just about the relationship piece, right? Um, when you speak someone's language, you, it, it, it's just so much easier to build that relationship so that you can now get to the business, whether it's mental health or an academic um, concern. Um, and I think about, uh, I think most high schools are gonna get like a family liaison next year. Mm -hmm. um, no, I shouldn't say most high schools. Yeah, so family liaison and additional social workers, and I think my and understanding. I love some school psychologists and some licensed mental health professionals. Yeah, and working on I, it all. I'm interested in all of the things. Yeah, definitely. And the idea, though, is is to is to, is to recruit folks who are culturally co competent. And, and and what does that mean, right? That means folks who can speak another language, folks who, who live in the neighborhoods and live in the communities, right? Yeah. So when I, I go to South Bay Mall, probably once or twice a week, and I see my students all the time, and they're like, "What are you doing here?" And I'm like, "Well." This is before COVID. Well, I don't live in the school, right? right. Like this is my community right. too. Right. And, and, and you see your folks, you know, in your community, and, and, and that's how you build 
and, and you and you can sort yeah. of it, it allows those difficult conversations that you have to have later um, so much easier because you've you've been able to build those relationships and those relationships are built on this whole notion and idea of one being culturally competent and I think we can define cultural competency in so many different ways mm -hmm. whether it's living in your community living the language um, you know there's, there's so many ways to describe it which which because I think oftentimes we think of race but it's not always no, race, it's right? shared it's, experiences it's shared exactly, experiences exactly and I think and, and so those are the type of folks that we need in our buildings and, I, and I'm excited that these um, new positions that I'm, I'm fairly certain most schools are getting I think you, you just confirmed that right um, I think with these new positions, we have a unique opportunity to do that. But I, I also want to echo what, what Sonia was saying just about our caseloads, right? So the recommendation is 250. Um, I think on average, teachers have between 100 and 120. You know, I personally today, I have 318 on my caseload. And, you know, in the fall, I spend a lot of times with seniors on college access work. Um, I have grades 10, 11, and 12. So I think about my sophomores who are maybe middle of the road, you know, not super high flyers, high flyers but also not failing. Those are the students I think about often because those are the students I'm not getting to. But those are the students that could benefit from having a relationship with me because I could help them become, get to that next level. But I'm not because I have all these other um, competing demands. Um, so I want to just echo what Sonia said because I think that's really, really important because I think um, our roles, um, we, like I said at the very beginning of this, like we're, we, we are a part, we are part of like every facet of a student's nice. school day. Um, and that's really important. But cult cultural competency, I think, is huge. Um, and I love that the district is moving towards this model um, when it comes to staffing and, and school personnel and school officials. Yeah. Well, you know, I also, you know, the caseload, I think, is a really important point and in, in something that I've done some work around with school nurses when we think about caseloads. But this is uh, very much pertinent to this conversation here and being able to afford services and meet your kids' needs. Um, and you can't do that when you have too large of a caseload. But that, that brings me to a question I've asked in all of these sessions that I've done. And um, I'll answer it first because something Val, you just said, reminded me of it. But our question is, if, the, if you had a magic wand, if you were the unicorn or you were looking for to bring the unicorn, what is that like, what's that one or two things that the district needs to do to really support our kids. And again, it's not, I'm not asking you for just, I, I'm looking for a suggestion, not holding you to it for the rest of your professional and personal lives. For me, I think that we need school counselors that are helping kids post graduation um, for that first year. I taught mostly juniors and seniors. I was a senior advisor for many of the years I taught. And it was shocking to me one year when we went over the grad, not the graduation rate, because we always knew what that was. We were classroom teachers, but it was a year later that we found some of the real information from kids who graduated, who we thought were going to college, and how many of those kids never ended up in a classroom in September. But it was a whole year later that we got that data through the PICS exit survey and some of the work they do following our kids. We need to. Um, I think do a much better job and a much warmer handoff to life after graduation from the Boston Public Schools. That would be my wish, and you know, as it relates to this conversation today. Val, what's your wish? Wow, you you kind of stole my thunder. So so that wow. is my, my wow, step. good ditto, ditto works. So, so that that's the so I, I mentioned the three areas of school counselors, like college and career. That is my favorite part of the job. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, because of the work, we, we kind of, not that we wash our hands, but once they graduate, it's kind of like, finally, they're done. Now I, now I can go on to the next class. And yeah. I think of this, this whole notion of summer melts or like yeah. financial aid support or signing a master promissory note. Um, or when the students get that first bill in July or August and they have no idea what to do with it. Um, and so I think we, we BP, as a district, we have this idea of like, our kids, we want our kids to graduate and go far, but once they leave us, what happens? I think of the, the valedictorian project that came out in the Globe a couple of years ago, and you know, my, my, my own relative was, was highlighted in that, and I just think about what happens to our kids once they leave us, and, and you know, is it our obligation to, to help and to, and, and to assist? And I think it is. And so to piggyback off what you're saying, I think that is also my wish, um, but I think with the caveat of, you know, I think about my job now, like I would love to do that work, but do I have the capacity to do that work? 
And so my, my larger wish is just, again, going back to this whole conversation around caseloads and just more increased supports for students when it comes to college and career, mental health, academic, outside of the classroom, right? I think, you know, there are a lot of supports for teachers. Um, I think because, you know, that's directly connected to whether it's testing or the achievement of our students, there's various support levels there. But when it comes to this other levels, it's, it's sort of this abstract thing, right? Um, I think I think we just need increased supports there. So that would be my wish, whether it's staffing, money, partnerships, right? We're, we are in Boston. And so there are tons of partnerships in our city. And so I think sometimes folks get territorial. Yeah. And, and I think as a city, as schools, we need to just work better together to ensure that students um, from zero to 25, whatever it is, whatever age you want to use, but that they are getting the best support so that they can go on and become the best versions of themselves and be able to afford to live in a city like Boston, yeah. right? Because otherwise, what are we doing? All right, what's the whole point of all of this? I love it. I wish. Love it. Uh, Jessica, quickly, your win. I would definitely just say in um, teachers and staff and, and also counselors, I know that we have so many things going on in during school, you know, in our own lives. But just my wish is normalizing, building rapport with families. I cannot stress it enough that if you know the family that you're reaching out to and, you know, having a conversation about the student and, and feeling safe to have this discussion with the family, um, I think conversations would then streamline into making sure that the, the family supported or the family feels heard, because I also can't stress enough on how many times I've Phone and they hear my voice and they're like, you're just who I needed to speak to. Let me tell you, this week has been crazy. And of course, I'm not there to, you know, lend a, a, a crying shoulder because we all have busy schedules. But understanding that if the family does in fact feel comfortable with reaching out to you or speaking to you in regards to something as easy as how's my kid doing? that could also lead to conversations um, that are a little more difficult and saying, you know, I'm, I'm facing a, some hardship right now. I don't know who to reach out to. And you being that person with the right resources to lend that support, it's it's just magic. And I and, and sorry to reference, you know, unicorns and magic, but this is real. Like what we do on a daily basis, it tries us, it um, leads us into, you know, that question of, what am I doing again? But at the same time, it's like you wake up and you know that if you're if you you're not there for them, it's almost like oh, I need to pick it up. I need to pick it up. My students need to see me there. Just like in my own experience, I know that the reason why I'm here and I go so hard for the student for my students now as an adult, it's because I had the right supports, even though my mom had you know, little to no clue what was usually going on because again, I was the translator or my older sis, um, my older siblings were translators before I was, but understanding that if we could, you know, build that bridge so families understand that, yes, we are doing a lot and we are stretched thin, but we are still there. Yeah, it speaks so that's my wish for people and families and staff to not feel a free child when it's necessary in a perfect world. Right? I love it. Thank you for that. Juan, tell me about your wish for um, your kids and for your work and thinking about all that's ahead of us. My wish is we get uh, every student right now get one-on-one -on -one tutoring ah. for the next two years because of this gap that we have and also food insecurity. Every, every kid gets fed for the next uh, uh, two years and not have to worry, not have, not have families worry about that and kids worry about that, those things, you know. It makes our life easier if we can, if they don't have to think about food or getting extra support on tutoring, you know. That, that to me is my wish. And it, it, it helps us and it helps our job in the future for these kids to graduate and move on to the next, next step in their life, you know. And that's things that I'm thinking about my that, that I wish I had a magic wand and had that for the students, you know? No, I love it. And I ask these questions because I take a list and it helps me in my work um, as education chair, as a city councilor, my work, I hope in the future, 
this is really good information. So I'm going to wrap up um, with this final question with my sister. Um, Sonia, tell me about your wish. If you were to make a wish um, for your students, thinking about the students that you work with now, for the district, for your school, for your school community, for your district, what's that wish? Um, I wish that we can really take the silver linings in this, in this whole mess mm -hmm. of the pandemic into post pandemic um so things like like jessica said laptops for every student like let's can we think creatively about what resources um that you know that we utilize during the pandemic that we can take into post pandemic um and also um at least you know it this year for me um i think just by sort of necessity, um, I have um, really worked so much closely with parents. So I want to definitely bring that same energy into, you know, every, you know, every year moving forward. Um, I think, you know, while no one wants to be stuck at home, I've met more siblings, I've met more parents, I've met more cat, like pet cats and pet dogs. And I feel like I know my students in a different way, you know? Yeah. Even something as simple as the profile picture on Zoom, you know, that's a place where students are showcasing their creativity, their art, their artist, um, artistic side, things like that. I mean, there are some incredible things coming out of this this really terrible time. So how can we harness that moving forward? So I don't really know what that looks like exactly, but let's let's be creative with that in whatever we end up doing post pandemic. I also, you know kind of the echo Val's point around, you know, really looking at testing and seeing what we really need and what we really don't need um, so that we can use that time for um, normalizing things like mental wellness, um, normalizing, asking for help, um, creating space for students to, you know, explore their interests so that they're not so, I mean, they're not so academic focused. And um, even though that's a good thing, like, making sure that they're very well-rounded. So I think, you know, post-pandemic, I would love to have more of that chance to do some of the um, sort of prevention and um, and promotion work as opposed to just the, you know, crisis and intervention work. Love it. And a little more support for the staff as well, mental health support, Plus, because yeah. that that is huge. That is huge. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say, so two things. One, I wish Boo Boo made a, an appearance this evening. Um, my, 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 um, my, my cat nephew, I don't even know if Boo Boo a girl or a boy. I don't even know. That's so terrible. No, so, so I didn't see my, my cat niece um, in today's session. But I do, you know, what Jessica just mentioned there, I really hope that you and your colleagues and, and all of our educators across the district but especially you that are responding to the crises that our kids and the chaos that our kids are experiencing, that you make sure that you find time for self-care. My sister reaches out to me and checks in on me to, to do my self-care, but I really hope that you and your colleagues find that opportunity to do that. Um, during today, I've had several friends just text me here on my phone. If I look down, I'm either taking notes or looking at a text at how much people have really appreciated and loved today's conversation. Um, we haven't solved um, the problems, but I think that we've created a greater awareness around some of the, the work that you're all doing, the hard work that you're doing, and the need uh, for us as a city, as a school district, and as those that are supporters, especially of public education. We've got, we've got a lot of work undone here in this space, and so I just, I'm so grateful that you were able to spend this time. Uh, this is the first time that we've gone well over our one hour, and I think that speaks to the the value of today's conversation and all that you've contributed. Um, I hope that everyone watching at home has enjoyed today's conversation. We've had lots of comments uh, in the chat section, so I appreciate that. Tomorrow, I will be again on Facebook Live at, at 10 a.m. for another Listen and Learn with local educators, so teachers in our Boston Public Schools to discuss teaching during this pandemic. And then on Saturday, I'll join some of my former students at 4 p.m. I hope that uh, those at home and, and you here with us will tune into all of those conversations. I'm so grateful for the four of you and for the work that you and your colleagues are doing. 
uh, to help our kids uh, get through this really difficult time and beyond. Uh, so much great gratefulness. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye.